Howdy folks and welcome to the Hillbilly Kitchen. Today we're making fried okra. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If a big pan of fried okra don't make you rejoice, I just don't know what will. And this is the same way that my granny made it. And you can use this method for your yellow squash and your zucchini. You can fry both of those in this, this exact same way. But today we're doing okra. Um, it's really a simple recipe and you can, if you want something even simpler, or if you need something gluten free, you can go back to the video where I did the yellow squash and you can fry your okra just like that. Um, that's like a three ingredient recipe, nothing easier than that on the planet. But what you need for this recipe is you need about six to eight pods of okra depending on how big they are. And if you're new to gardening and you're growing okra, you want to pick it when it's about this size, when it gets up this size and bigger, it tends to get woody and hard and the seeds get really big and hard and it's just not good for eating anymore. This is a little bit small, um, but it's kind of picky. I mean, you know, that window where you can eat it is kind of slim. And you need, uh, I'm using cornmeal mix, which is half flour, half cornmeal. And it does have a little bit of baking powder and stuff in it. Uh, you can use plain cornmeal if you need gluten free or you can use cornmeal mixed with like potato flour or some other gluten free flour. You don't have to have the cornmeal mix to do this. That's just what I like best. I think that gives you the crispest, um, crunchiest fried okra. You uh, can also use just plain flour in this, but the flavor of the corn in the cornmeal really adds to the flavor of the fried okra. And we're going to use an egg in this, and that's going to make it extra crunchy. Um, like I said, you can go back to the video where I just did the yellow squash. You don't have to have the egg because the okra has its own um, secretion that makes the breading bind to it but the egg will add it to it and it will make it extra crunchy it'll give you more batter more breading um, and what you're going to end up with the way i've cut this and with the egg you're going to end up with about the same amount of breading as you actually have in vegetable so you know keep that in mind you might want to cut yours a little bit thicker I like mine sliced thin about a quarter inch. You can go up to half an inch and it will still come out just fine, especially with this recipe. And you need a little salt and pepper, which is just a taste. And I like to add a little sugar. Now this is optional, but you're using the sugar in this not to sweeten it so much as as a spice. So let's get started here. We want to beat up our egg. And you want to add your sliced okra to the egg and you want to make sure it all gets coated really good especially um, the outside edge because that's not going to have as much of the um, liquid out of the okra as the center part does obviously and that's going to one of the things that's going to make it extra crunchy is that you're making it more sticky on the outside. Stir it all around in there good. Make sure it gets all the edges and none of your okra is stuck together and not getting in your egg. Okay, and we'll let that sit there while we add some spices to our breading. Um, well, like I said, the salt and the pepper are just a taste. I'm going to do about a quarter teaspoon of pepper. I've got a half a cup of this cornmeal mix here. Um, and if you have leftovers, you can put it in the refrigerator 
and you can use it, you know, over the next couple of days to bread, squash, or more okra, or zucchini, or whatever. You do want to put it in the fridge because it's going to have this egg in it. You don't want to leave it sitting out on the countertop. And I'm going to use about a quarter teaspoon of salt. And this is about a teaspoon of sugar. And like I said, it's up to you whether or not you put that in there. But I really like it. It accents the flavor. And it really adds to what you end up with. And if you have picky eaters, it will be the difference in them eating vegetables like squash and okra. Just a teaspoon of sugar because it makes it taste that much better. Now, you do want to leave this sitting in the egg for just a minute, but it, the time that it took us to add the spices to the cornmeal and uh, get that mixed up, that's plenty enough time. And then you just want to transfer it from the egg into the cornmeal. Separate it as you take it out of your egg to make sure it's not stuck together and kind of let any extra egg drip off. And as you put it in your cornmeal, it's a good idea to kind of cover it as you go. That way it doesn't stick together again. And you can do this in a bag. You can add your um, breading in a bag and then put your okra in the bag and toss it. Or you can do it in a bowl with a lid on it. Just kind of however you want to do it. I have found that with the current shortages, um, I'm trying not to use anything disposable like bags, paper towels, things like that. I'm trying to use more wash and reuse things <laughs> those disposable items are getting scarce and even if you can get out and get them who in the world wants to go out right now the way things are okay once you get it all in the breading you want to take it out and sit it on a rack and you want to leave it sitting in the breading before you put it in the pan, about 15 to 20 minutes. We've talked about this with other breaded um, foods. Anytime you're making anything that you're breading, it's a good idea to let it sit with the breading on it. And what that does is it adheres the breading to whatever you're frying. And it will keep it from coming off in the pan. Once that breading gets completely moist, it's far less likely that it's going to break off and come off in the pan and you're going to have a big old mess of burnt breading in your pan. That's not good, it's not tasty, and it don't give you extra crunchy anything. If you don't have um, a cooling rack, now is a really good time to invest in a couple because like I said, the disposable products, the paper towels and that kind of thing, they're getting hard to find. They're getting unreal expensive. And racks are good for a lot more than just cooling your cookies and your pies and your cakes on. They're good for draining your fried foods on. It actually will make your fried foods a little crisper. And you don't have that big paper towel mess when you're done to deal with. But because they're not sitting down in the grease that has absorbed in the paper towel, the bottom of them, whatever you're frying, stays much crisper if you drain it on a rack instead of on paper towels. So it'll save you money and the food you make will actually be a little bit better. Now what I'm doing is I'm just making sure every one of these is coated nice and even and there's not any big chunks of dry breading left on it. They're not stuck together. Um, you really don't want them stuck together. That don't make them good either. Okay, you can see here we've got most of the breading left. I mean, even with that egg, it's not like you're eating all flour and cornmeal. Um, you're still getting a vegetable. And this is definitely not an instant potato food. 
this is what I call a labor of love food because it does take a little bit of time. Um, if you need something quicker though, um, I'm going to link that yellow squash video and you can do your okra just like that. It's much faster, but this is extra crispy. It's extra tasty. It will probably, well, I know it's going to be the best okra you ever ate. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than this right here. The reason why I was putting this on the rack and spread it all out after I put it in the breading is because if you leave it in the breading, it's going to continue to um, have more breading stick to it until it gets so thick that it will fall off when you put it in the pan and it's not good. And if you pile it up um, in a bowl or something, it's going to stick to itself as it gets moist. So you want to spread it out on a rack or a plate or a piece of wax paper or something. You don't want to leave it piled up in the bowl where you breaded it. If I didn't say it already, anytime you're cooking fresh vegetables, you want to make sure you wash them before you cook them. And you do want to trim the ends off of the okra, both the uh, top and the bloom end. Okay, once you've got it all braided and it's laid out on your rack, now you can get your pan ready. We want to get the pan really hot before we put the okra in it and you need enough oil to fry it in. You want at least a quarter of a cup of oil in your pan. You can fry it in bacon grease, you can fry it in Crisco, um, you can use any oil you want. There are a lot of healthier choices right now. You kind of got to use what you can get. Um, you can fry it in butter, which would be very expensive because it would probably take at least half a stick of butter, maybe a whole stick of butter, to get it deep enough in your pan to fry it. You can also deep fry it. If you have a deep fryer and you use a deep fryer a lot, you can definitely deep fry this. Uh, you know, how you cook it really just depends on you, but you do want to get the oil hot before you put it in and you do want to let it sit I said at least 15 minutes before you actually start frying it if you've got kids who are super picky eaters and you can't get them to eat a vegetable no matter what you do this is a good um, choice most kids really like this little I'm talking like toddlers and stuff because it's little bite-sized pieces and it's crunchy um, it's one of the few vegetables that you can get kids to eat. And a lot of people have commented on the fried squash and said when they do the fried squash, they call them cookies and give them to their kids and kids will eat them. They, you know, you just don't say what's actually in it. You just give it to them. And a lot of them will eat it because they really like the texture. And it's a way to get kids to eat vegetables. Once we get the oil hot, we're going to cook this on about medium heat, but you're going to have to adjust it, um, and it's going to depend on your stove, how hot it gets. I'm still getting used to this uh, little gas cooktop here. It's definitely different than electric, and it's been a while since I actually had a gas stove to cook on. It's been over 30 years. Um, Brett and I have been married almost 35 years, and my mom had a gas stove, so I always cooked on a gas stove when I was growing up. But like I said, that's been a few years, so I'm having to get used to it all over again. I want to thank all y'all while this pan here is heating up. On August the 3rd, we hit 200,000 subscribers, which means we went from 100,000 to 200,000 in like uh, nine months, I think eight or nine months, something like that, which is pretty good. I really appreciate everybody who subscribed, everybody who watches, everybody who shares the videos, comments. Um, those of you who share the videos, that helps so much. I just can't even tell you how much that helps. But I especially want to thank those of you who have said that you're praying for the channel and you're praying for me and you're praying for my family. Uh, prayers somebody else praying for you is really the greatest gift somebody can give you. I mean, I, I cannot even express how much I appreciate that. For somebody to take their time with the Lord and intercede for me. 
this channel is really being blessed because of your prayers and we have grown beyond what I imagined and beyond what I believed was possible in this short amount of time. Uh, and I think it truly is because God is blessing it because you are praying. Brett and I have almost stopped watching the news. Um, somehow the other day it came on the local Knoxville news. He was changing channels and just got bored and stopped or something. I don't know. And then the news came on and, you know, they started out with all the bad stuff going on. Nothing good to say at all. And then after like 15 minutes, they said, and now we're going to pause for a Zen moment. I almost fell out of my chair. I mean, this is the local Knoxville news. And 50 years ago, they would have been leading the nation in prayer. I, I just don't understand that. I don't understand that drastic change in attitude. Because prayer really does change things. And having God intercede on your behalf really, I mean, it's an unreal power. So, I was thinking about it, and I had this idea. Let's check our oil here. Not hot yet. We'll leave that little one in there and watch for it to start popping. But... When they said that, I said, you know, they should, they would have been leading the nation in prayer, especially in Knoxville, Tennessee. I mean, that's what this area, there's more churches around here than you can even count. They're on every corner. And that the stuff that they're doing and they're giving us calming moments and stuff like that, which is just, it's, it boggles your mind. But anyway, I said I had this idea. When Jesus was asked how to pray, he gave us the Lord's Prayer. And if you, the more you study the Bible, the more you learn about God, the more you realize that the Lord's Prayer really covers everything. And it's not necessarily a prayer for the individual praying it. It's a prayer for everybody. And if you're new to, newly saved, a new Christian, and you're trying to learn how to pray, definitely study the Lord's Prayer because Jesus gave it to us to teach us how to pray. And Psalms is just absolutely full of prayers too. But Jesus said that whenever two or three of you are gathered together, there I will be with you. So, or there I will be also, depending on which verse you're reading or which translation of the Bible you're reading. God is always going to be there. He's never going to change. The Lord's Prayer is not going to change. So whether you're watching this video in August of 2020, right after it's uploaded, or you're watching it 20 years from now or sometime in between, I'm sure there's going to be stuff on that or stuff going on that needs prayer, that needs prayer, not just you in your own life, but everybody around you, maybe everybody in the world. And right now we're going through a worldwide thing. So whether you're watching it, like I said, in August of 2020 or 20, 30 years from now or somewhere in between, I want you to join with me right now. And I want you to pray the Lord's Prayer Pray it for each other. Pray it for our families. Pray it for our communities. Pray it for our countries. And pray it for our world. For everybody who watches this video from now until whatever time it doesn't exist anymore. And whether you're watching it now or in 30 years, as long as we're doing it together, Jesus said he will be there. So, for each other and for everybody in our lives and everybody around us, even those people we don't know, please join with me now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And maybe if you could just say it, just that. If you can't think of anything else to pray, that's the prayer to pray. Because it really does cover everything. And I want to thank you for joining me. Um, and whether you believe or are a believer or not, whether you are saved or not, everybody who has joined with me has prayed that prayer for you. And so have I. Prayer really does change things, and God really does perform miracles. And He'll be doing it for as long as this video is here. Okay, our um, pan is starting to sizzle now. You can see our one little okra piece that we put there in the middle. It's actually brown on one side already. So we're going to go ahead and start adding this kind of slow. We'll add it to the middle because that's obviously the hottest spot. That's where my burner is. But because I'm cooking this in cast iron, um, the heat's going to be pretty evenly distributed by the pan. And a lot of people ask me about what kind of pan to buy. And I have probably seven or eight different brands of skillets. There are things that make a good skillet and it's not necessarily a brand. You want a skillet that has a thick bottom. The thicker the bottom, the better. Cast iron, of course, has a very thick bottom. Cast iron, though, is not coated and it's very hard to take care of. Um, it's a labor of love, kind of like this okra. If you get a non-stick coated pan, I do recommend um, the porcelain coating because they are supposed to be healthier. Who knows what we're going to find out about them in a few years. But they've been using porcelain to coat cookware for a few, at least a hundred years, maybe two or three hundred years. Um, it used to be just to protect it, and now it's a non-stick finish. But how thick it is, is really probably the most important thing. And the next thing is the kind of finish that you want. Um, stainless steel is an option. It's not coated. Well, you can get it coated or uncoated, but uncoated. You know, you don't have any of those issues with health and the coating on the pan. But you can get really thick stainless steel pans, and you can even get them that have different layers in between them. Um, I have a set of pots and pans that Alex gave me years ago. They were a wedding gift from a fiancé, who, and the wedding didn't happen. And she said, I can't keep these pans after she got married to a different fella. So she gave them to me, and they have a layer of cast iron in between stainless steel. They are extremely heavy and extremely durable. But there are a lot of pans like that that have cast iron in the middle of them. And you can get um, enamel coated cast iron now. There are several brands of enamel coated cast iron. Cast iron is also extremely heavy. Um, but any skillet with a really thick bottom on it is going to be heavy. The problem with the skillets that have the thin bottoms on them is that they tend to warp from the heat. So, you know, get as thick of a pan as you can afford and as thick of a pan as you can lift. And as far as what it's made out of, it just kind of depends on what your preferences are. 
I mean, if you want something that's fast and easy to take care of, easy to clean, I would get um, the enamel coated stuff. And Samantha actually bought me a set of Green Life cookware several years ago for Christmas. And I have used that stuff for years and I'm still using it. Now it's starting to get some pits in the finish and the finish don't look so good, but I put it in the dishwasher and used it for close to 10 years, I guess, maybe longer, and it still is holding up. And it's super cheap. Um, I think a whole set you can still get for about 60 bucks. And if you wait until near Christmas, you might be able to get it a little cheaper. So anyway, as far as brands go, I don't really have a favorite brand of skillet. Um, thicker stuff is definitely better. You want to keep an eye on this um, because it will burn pretty quick and that doesn't really matter what you're cooking it in. You want to get it nice and golden brown on both sides and if you have enough oil in your pan it kind of does deep fry just in a skillet not in a deep fryer. You don't have to have a deep fryer to get that deep fried taste. Now you're going to take this out kind of like you put it in one piece at a time as it gets brown make sure it's brown on both sides as my granny got older my and there were more and more of us green kids running around everywhere my aunt dot she took over more and more of the cooking and i remember her standing and she would cook this for hours and all of us kids would kind of gather around and we would eat it as quick as she could pull it out of the pan. And no matter what kind of skillet you're cooking this in, as it gets really close to all being done, you can go ahead and cut the heat off on your stove. Um, on the gas, if you're using a gas stove, of course, the heat goes off instantly. But using any kind of skillet you're going to have heat left in your oil especially if you're using a cast iron skillet there's going to be a lot of heat left in the pan and it will finish cooking it um, because once you get down to a few pieces in your pan if you don't turn the heat off your oil is going to get too hot really fast and those last few pieces are going to burn instead of brown that's how you get it all done without those last few pieces burning up on you. And that's, you know, it's not hard to make this and it's not hard to make it come out absolutely perfect, super crunchy every time, but it does take a little bit of time. And like I said, it's one of those foods that's kind of a labor of love. It's not instant by any means. Um, you got to cut it up, you got to put it in the egg, then you got to bread it, then you got to let it sit a little while, then you got to fry it, and you do want to fry it in a single layer in your pan, you don't want to stack it up, but as long as you let it sit for that 15-20 minutes, it's not going to stick together once you put it in your pan. So that makes it a little bit easier to cook um, if you don't have to worry about sticking together in the pan and you don't have to worry about sticking to the pan. Uh, you can see we didn't lose much braiding at all. Of course, there's a little bit of cornmeal and stuff down in the bottom, but that's not much. It's all still on our okra where we want it, so it'll be super crunchy. I hope you give this recipe a try. And, you know, even if you don't make it every single day, if you've got kids you can't get to eat vegetables, this is the recipe for them. If you've got a picky husband who won't touch squash or okra or... <laughs> just about anything out of the garden this will he will eat this um brett swears he hates vegetables but he always eats this and he even asks for it when the garden gets going and i start getting stuff out of garden he's when are you gonna make us some okra when are you gonna make us some okra so it is something that even people who don't necessarily like vegetables they'll eat it so give it a try um Take the time. It's perfect as a side dish. It's good as a snack, side dish for anything. Um, and it's good as an appetizer if you're just looking for something maybe before you have a big meal 
that you want to let people snack on, this is good. I think as a kid, we always had it as an appetizer because, like I said, we stood there as my Aunt Dot would take it out of the pan and grab it as quick as she could pull it out of the pan. Um, and we'd fight over it because it's not it's something that we would only get when it was coming out of the garden and when she had time to make it. So it was kind of a special thing. And it's one of those foods, too, that I have a lot of memories attached to, and those memories make it even better. So I hope you enjoy it, and I thank you so much for joining us in the Hillbilly Kitchen. If you have not already, please don't forget to click like and subscribe before you leave, and give our videos a share. Until next time, remember to put God first. Thank you.